Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a look back at the most important aviation stories of the past week by the AIN editors who covered them. I'm AIN Alerts Editor Chad Trumpeter. In this week's episode, Editor-in-Chief Matt Thurber pours over the NTSB docket details about the August 2019 crash involving a Cessna Citation Latitude carrying race car driver Dale Earnhardt Jr. And he also talks about his participation in SimVenture, a virtual Oshkosh fly-in. And senior editors Gregory Pollock, Charles Alcock, Carrie Lynch, and Kurt Epstein give an overview of AIN's coverage of FIA Connect this week and the main themes that emerged during the virtual Farnborough Air Show. Those were government objectives versus financial aid, sustainability as a business opportunity, and the emerging urban air mobility market. So, Matt, you did a story this week on the Dale Earnhardt crash. I think it was in August of 2019. The docket was released uh, just last week, and there were some pr- pretty surprising things in there, wasn't there? Chad, you're right. The, uh, the docket information is basically just factual information that the NTSB releases as it gathers it during the investigation, but it also forms uh, much of the basis on which they eventually do decide the probable cause. And you're right, there was some very interesting information in it, and uh, it doesn't take much reading between the lines to see what went wrong. So what did go wrong? Some of the facts released by the NTSB in this docket showed that For example, on this particular flight to Elizabethton Municipal Airport in uh, North Carolina. This was a new airplane, too. This is a Citation uh, Latitude, and it's it's only been in service for about two or three years now. So it's it's a fairly new aircraft type. Yeah, and it's, it's like most Citations, pretty easy to fly and, and pretty forgiving, too. The, uh, Calculations showed that it, at its landing weight, it would need about 3,000 of the uh, airport's 5,000-foot runway, although there is a displaced threshold of 902 feet, but there's still plenty of room. Um, but one of the pieces of information was that the VREF was calculated at 108 knots, although the captain flying in the left seat Uh, set the target speed to 112 knots, which is not unusual. Everybody likes a little bit of margin. But interestingly, in in his post-accident write-up on what happened, the captain said that he was carrying extra speed on the approach because the airplane slows down so easily. There was lots of really good data recorded by onboard devices and what ended up happening is the first time they touched down, the data showed they were going 126 knots. Now, one of the other interesting pieces of this is that just after selecting full flaps on the cockpit voice reporter, the first officer says, and I don't need to tell you, we're really fast. And the captain said, I'm at idle. And then he asked, do I need to go around? And the first officer said no. The captain, after a couple more brief sentences, said, all right, I'll be on the TRs, the thrust reversers, quickly. That was uh, just before the first touchdown. So obviously you can see there's kind of a mindset. I've got to get on the thrust reversers quickly to make sure we slow down on this, not really short runway, but to make sure they get down and stopped. Right. So then what happened? Well, the latitude actually touched down three times before the final touchdown. And it's it's interesting because this docket includes Textron Aviation's report, which was full of detail about exactly what happened based on the recorded data. And just after the first touchdown, the uh, thrust reverser deployment was commanded by moving the throttles to the reverse idle position. But the problem was the aircraft bounced back into the air before the command could be executed. Mm. And it touched down a second time, 1.2 seconds later, the throttles were still in the reverse idle position. 
The second time it touched nose first, then the right main gear, but the left gear did not register as being on ground. It bounced again, then touched down a third time later. And this time, all three gear registered as being on ground. So now the thrust reverser is deployed and they unlocked 0.4 seconds after the touchdown. But then the throttles were moved to idle and this sent a thrust reverser stow command almost immediately after the reversers were unlocked, but also before the gear status changed to in air. Uh, to say that the system was, <laughs> well, the system wasn't confused. It did exactly as was commanded, but it didn't give the result that the pilots were looking for. So after this final bounce, the aircraft went airborne. Remember the gear now is saying it's, it's in air. So this triggers a cut in hydraulic power to the thrust reverser actuators. But now this allowed the unlocked thrust reversers to be pulled open by aerodynamic forces. Then the throttles were advanced to max takeoff power. But the thrust reversers reached deployment shortly after that. And so the engine's FADEC electronic controllers wouldn't allow engine thrust to increase because the thrust reversers are deployed. Right. So it, uh, the latitude did make it up to about 24 feet for a few seconds. And then uh, the crew went from full flaps to flaps two. The airspeed dropped to 91 knots from 119 knots as the flaps retracted. And the uh, power levers were moved partially back, then forward, then all the way back to idle. Then the pitch attitude increased, the stick shaker activated, and the latitude touched down for the final time at a 3.2 G vertical force in the right gear. Then on the left gear, basically the, the airplane stayed on the ground then on the runway and partially off the runway, so the brakes weren't really affected because only one main gear was actually on the runway. And the nose finally came down Eight seconds after the final touchdown, crossed the end of the runway on center line, and then four seconds after that, the aircraft experienced an impact of 3.4 Gs vertically. The fuselage began rolling left, and then five seconds later came to rest with the fuselage rolled 42 degrees left. Sounds like quite a ride. Yeah, I can't, uh, I'm sure it was, it was pretty traumatic. The, uh, after the latitude stopped, the crew tried to open the main cabin door and they were having trouble with it. So then one of the passengers, uh, Dale Earnhardt, the race car driver, and the captain tried to open the emergency overwing exit, but they couldn't get that open either. And uh, the first officer uh, had stayed behind in the cockpit to fire the engine bottles and turn off the batteries. and he went back to try to open the main door and got it partially open. And the two pilots, Earnhardt, his wife and daughter were able to get out of the now burning airplane. And the airplane basically burnt to, uh, it was almost unrecognizable after it, it burned to the ground, right? Yeah, it was total. It was very, very good that they got out. So I guess the lesson here is Extra speed on approach isn't a good thing. Yeah, I mean, reading the information, looking at the, the charts of the data, Textron Aviation points it out in, in its report that was included in the docket. It says airspeed management was a significant issue during the approach. Even if you're flying an airplane that's easy to slow down, uh, that doesn't mean you don't have to slow it down at the proper times. So Textron even said from the data that the, the whole approach was unstable? Basically, they didn't call it an unstable approach, but here's what Textron said. As the descent was initiated, airspeed was 201 knots with gear flaps and speed brakes retracted and partial thrust. 
airspeed increased to 220 knots over the following 30 seconds, which precluded the extension of landing gear and flaps too, which would have provided additional drag to help slow down the airplane. The need for speed reduction was evidently apparent to the crew throughout the descent as seen by the partial extension of speed brakes and by the extension of landing gear and flaps immediately after each of their maximum extension speeds was reached. Sounds like this is going to be a good lesson for everybody, uh, just to remind them to uh, keep on the airplane on approach. Absolutely, and and just my own, this is my own personal opinion, and I'm not saying who did what wrong here, but it was a, it was a VFR flight, very short, 18 minutes between two airports, not much time to get up and down. And like anything in aviation, every flight has to be treated with the same respect for safety margins and proper procedures, flying the profiles as, as any flight. doesn't matter if it's five minutes or five hours. Right. Actually, let's talk about flying. Uh, this week was the, uh, the virtual Oshkosh event. Uh, virtual air venture, I guess. Um, and they had a uh, simulator fly in, and you took part in that. So, tell us what it was like to fly into Oshkosh virtually since the real event was canceled because of the COVID pandemic. Well, this was a lot of fun. So, Pilot Edge, which operates a real time air traffic control system for desktop simulators, set up what they called Sim Venture. And what they did is replicate the experience of flying into Oshkosh during the annual Air Venture Air Show. And everybody knows this is a super busy, full of traffic event. And the interesting thing was that I, I set up my simulator, I read the NOTAM, figured out where I had to be, and I flew towards Oshkosh starting out with uh, circling over Green Lake and then entering the uh, Ripon intersection at 1,800 feet and 90 knots, then flying to Fisk, maintaining the altitude and the speed and watching for other traffic. And since we're all on the same network, every other person participating, their airplane was also in the, uh, in the system and I could see them. And if, if there was somebody ahead of, them, ahead of me, I had to maintain half a mile spacing behind them. Same for people behind me. So I followed another airplane uh, towards Fisk. And then when I got to Fisk, just like the real Oshkosh, the controller called me out and said, Orange Cessna, rock your wings. I did rock my wings and Pilot Edge was set up so that the controllers could see that I was, I was uh, responding to the wind rocking command. And he told me to continue on the uh, Fisk transition to runway 36. So I did that exactly as the NOTAM recommended. And he handed me off to the tower and the tower had me rock my wings then cleared me, cleared me to land on runway 18 right, the skinny runway, which is normally a taxiway on the green square. And once I landed, I could see there was a bunch of other airplanes there, and the uh, virtual show was in full swing. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Sounds like uh, the, about the best you could do right now, I guess, uh, this week. Well, not only was it fun, Chad, but if I ever get to fly into Oshkosh for real, which I haven't been able to do yet, I have a lot more confidence that I'll know exactly how to do it safely. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Greg, this week we cover the virtual farm borough event, uh, FIA Connect, and uh, you, were, you were kind of in charge of everything. So can you just give us an a overview of what you thought about you know, everything that was, that was talked about this week? Yeah, sure, Chad. Um, what, 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 what really struck me, I think, um, more than anything, were the kind of uh, sober assessments of the uh, prospects for a recovery. I mean, there's, there was no mincing words, really. Um, most of the people are saying that uh, it's, you know, like a tra air, air, airline traffic recovery probably won't take 
take place until the middle of the decade. And and some are saying, you know, industry at large, not in another decade, maybe uh, things might finally get back to some some sense of normalcy. Um, in terms of airplane development itself, some uh, high profile uh, executives agreed it would take, you know, several years for new aircraft develop, the developments to surface. Um, uh, maybe uh, the best opportunity lies with uh, like su- so-called uh, sustainability initiatives. And airlines, in fact, are, are saying it, uh, it plans uh, to introduce a hydrogen or, or Airbus is saying it has plans to introduce a hydrogen powered airplane by 2035. And, and I think that's the talk is that that's probably going to be their next they're, they're, they're pointing toward that as their next uh, narrow body uh, uh, development um, in, in terms of a clean sheet design anyway. Um, so um, and then and then uh, there seems to be a uh, little appetite to invest uh, billions in uh, in conventionally powered aircraft right now. Uh, government mandates are uh, related to sustainability uh, could uh Ironically, raise uh, an, an economic opportunity for manufacturers. And I think that was another another big issue. And then on the defense side, um, there was talk about the Tempest. That was the big the big uh, project, um, and uh, and its greater focus on collaboration. Now that the program includes Italy and Sweden, um, the, those partners are consolidating efforts to accelerate the start of. Uh, of, of the main development phase. So um, overall, though, I think the, the, the show itself was more uh, UK focused than I had expected. Um, th- that just might have been a, a function of the fact that uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure why, actually, but, um, uh, you know, um, and uh, but but there were there was there was quite an opportunity there to, to pick up a lot of good information even though i think the the the, the webinar sounded more more like academic exercises than than real press conferences per se that we would normally see at a at an air show um but uh it, it was a good opportunity i think there was a lot of there was there was a lot of information um sort of uh squeezed into uh, uh, a few days and uh, it was quite educational i thought yeah and i think one of the big themes was um government mandates and government aid. Um, and Charlie, can you speak to that? Yes, government aid was very much on the agenda and picking up on the point that Greg just raised, that is a sore point in the UK. Um, so, you know, the UK aerospace industry is suffering every bit as badly as, as all the other main aerospace players. And it is true that it has received some help from the UK government, but it's mainly so far just been short term help, you know, some some assistance in covering the costs of furloughing employees. It's just short term stuff. And the point that several of the UK leaders raised during this FIA Connect event was that they need long term strategic help. And, you know, they pointed to the fact that the French government, for example, has already committed, uh, I think it's something like, Uh, $15 billion to aerospace alone. It's a real serious, concerted, long-term plan. And all the money that the UK politicians were bragging about uh, in the Farber event this week was, you know, money that's already been committed. And yet they were sort of claiming credit for it as if it was new money. Um, And you might well say, well, you know, what right does the UK industry have to even expect that help? Well, the thing is, the UK government is saying that aerospace is critical to Britain's economic recovery. It's saying this is a top priority. Uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, is talking, you know, personally setting a goal of having a, a carbon-free uh, wide-body airliner by 2050, as if he's President Jack Kennedy, you know, promising that, that uh, the country is going to get a man on the moon. And, you know, if he's going to be doing all that sort of pitching and bragging, the industry says, fine, back that up with some money and let's get going and do this. So it is a contentious point. What I always hear as an insider is, you know, the industry is trying to be diplomatic. It's trying to be sort of graceful. But uh, underneath it all, it's actually quite frustrated at this, at this, you know, some somewhat uh, uh, less than clear approach that the government's taking. And then, of course, on top of all that, the industry in the UK is dealing with um, the, the, the real hard consequences of, of a no trade agreement 
uh, Brexit coming up. So it was a very sore point. Yeah, it seems like things are kind of disjointed. Um, they're not putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, I think that's it. Now, you know, the, the, the defenders of the government say, hey, give us a break. You know, this COVID thing hit us very hard. You know, we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to make people safe. You know, don't just keep carping at us about what we're not doing. And that's not an unfair point. But again, look at what France is doing. A very, very serious commitment to aerospace. Germany, the same. Um, in the US, there's also been some help. Other countries, industries are doing this. If you're going to make that a national priority, you have to back that up with uh, with action and not just come out with slogans to make people feel better. So let's talk about aircraft development. Carrie, Airbus executives said that uh, we shouldn't expect to see any new aircraft designs for a couple of years, right? Well, actually, that's a pretty much an industry contention that m- most people believe that right now with the COVID pandemic, they're talking, you know, aircraft deliveries, commercial aircraft deliveries being down by half over the next several years. And with layoffs and, you know, you're hearing numbers such as 70 percent declines in um, passenger traffic. There just isn't any cash. There's massive layoffs. Everybody's cutting costs. So that's going to take a toll on research and development efforts. And, um, and, and to have a new aircraft program is very, very costly. I, one panel I listened to, uh, with some of these jumbo jets, they put it in the terms of the tens of billions, like 30 or 40 billion. So it's a huge risk to develop a new program. And so there just isn't the money right now to come forward with major loss or major launches where you might see it um, is in the regional sector, because those routes are coming back earlier or expected to. And um, and so there will be a need for a refresh of those aircraft. Now, there's again, because of the cost of new aircraft, what we may see First, uh, or a continuation of our derivatives. And, you know, we have derivatives that are five decades old, such as the 737, but there's much less risk associated with that. Having said that, the approach to certification because of the 737 MAX likely will be very different, much more thorough. There won't be anything unknown about these plans going forward because regulators are really intensifying the scrutiny. Now, going back to what may bring on new aircraft, and um, this is something where Airbus comes in front and center, is um, innovation in the environmental front. You know, um, Stephen Uvar Hazi and Tim Clark, the head of um, Emirates and Air Lease Corporation, the heads of Emirates and Air Lease Corporation, you know, say that no new aircraft design really should come forward until there's new technologies to forward it on the environmental front. Because going forward, what we have now is just not going to be acceptable um, on, on the political scheme and on the global scheme and from an environmental front, even though we're much more efficient now, we're going to need technologies that bring the industry to z- net zero emissions by 2050. So that should lead the design of new aircraft. And Airbus is one of those who are looking at that. And they're thinking maybe in the 2030s timeframe, um, Greg mentioned it earlier, that they'll come out with a hydro, a plane that can run on hydrogen. And they say that decisions on that might come in the next few decades. I mean, in the next few years, in the 24, 25, uh, 2024, 2025 timeframe. And, um, be, and they should start working with airports and other suppliers to begin paving the path to see if that is possible. That's a great segue into Kurt, who did a lot of on sustainability this week. And like Greg said, um, some of these companies are seeing sustainability as a business opportunity. So what do they have to say about that, Kurt? Well, Chad, sustainability was foremost in the minds of a lot of the uh, people, a lot of the panels. And uh, one thing that was basically a general consensus was that it's a multifaceted approach, that there isn't going to be one silver bullet, which is all of a sudden going to make everything wonderful in terms of carbon emissions. Everything it's has to be looked at uh, as a large palette of options, and everything has to be incremental all combining up to hopefully reach this goal of net zero carbon emissions. Um, 
the three pillars that the industry's always hung its uh, its hat on. And this comes in the form of three things. There's uh, there's um, aircraft and engine optimization, and companies are working on these things. Uh, we had um, we had um, Rolls Royce's chief technology officer uh, describing one of the projects they're working on with Airbus, which is the ultrafan, which is a huge, huge uh, in diameter engine fan. As he described as so large, you could drive a subway car through the engine fan case, and uh, that fan moves slowly uh, in terms in comparison to uh, normal sized fans. And he said that's going to give a uh, very, um, as far as being fuel efficient, it's also going to add uh, reduce uh, noise on the engine, so it'll add other benefits. Um, other other the other plan is uh, air route um, modernization. And we had the head of Et- Etihad Airlines describing how these air routes basically haven't changed in decades, basically as he described it since the days of the Romans, describing how antiquated some of them are. And he says that's where another uh, area of improvement can come. The company's been doing some research, some test flights with its 787s, uh, using continuous descent and continuous uh, continuous ascent and continuous descent and various other optimizations, and they've seen improvements. So he said that's another area where we can gain some benefits. But the last one, and the one that's the most current and the one uh, most uh, obtainable right now, is the use of sustainable aviation fuels. And that's been a growing business. A lot of companies have their hats in the ring. Uh, Airbp gave a uh, gave a an interview earlier to, uh, before the show to me, and they described their benefits in this. And they have a deal with a company called uh, Fulcrum, uh, Fulcrum Aerospace, and they are uh, working on a. I'm sorry, Fulcrum Bioenergy, and they're going to be bringing a plant online later this year near Reno, Nevada. And uh, BP has a thirty million dollar equity stake in the company, and their uh, goal is to be producing uh, lots of jet fuel now. When I say lots, we're talking still millions of gallons rather than barrels full, but enough as they describe it to hopefully make a difference. So when you say that uh, there's there's uh, business opportunities, yeah, there's three areas where there are business opportunities. So what's the uh, opportunities in the UK for SAF, Kurt? Well, uh, the UK Secretary for Transport uh, recently introduced this uh, Jet Zero uh, Council, which is the government uh, government's pledge to back up the industry as far as its uh, its talk about being carbon neutral for 2050, and it's going to be a working group to kind of uh, go along with this. But there was one session that I uh, that I listened in on where they described the uh, SAF opportunities in the UK, and currently there is absolutely no U- uh, no sustainable aviation fuel production in the UK, and very little very little usage of it and that's something that really needs to change if the industry if the uh, industry is actually going to meet those government goals of carbon neutrality by 2050 and uh, a UK consultancy PA consulting has prepared a white paper on this which will be released in August and they gave a uh, preview on this and they described you know the various benefits that could be arrived they they described this as a major business opportunity for the UK worth billions of pounds and um, possibly up to uh, more than 10,000 job opportunities. And they describe what needs to be done to make this happen. And they also point out that the UK is a natural, um, sits astride one of the most lucrative flight routes, that of the transatlantic. Uh, It's it's a very good opportunity and that there is interest among airlines to do this, but the price has to be at a competitive uh, rate. And as they described it, um, the SAF industry, which is a nascent industry, is going up against one of the most optimized and established um, uh, fuel distribution systems in the world. And obviously with its uh, with its economies of scale and various things, it's not a fair fight right now between SAF and the and the conventional jet A market. And they say that there is various things that have to be done to try and even the playing field. And among those are government based measures. Uh, so there, to go back to what uh, other people said, the government um, governments need to now walk the walk instead of just talk the talk if they want to really 
foster development in this. And that would also entail private uh, spurring private investment in this in the UK. They need to show that they're fully behind this in a way that is very visible and very productive and very fostering to uh, investment in this industry and to establish this in a reasonable way where there's going to be enough production to make a difference. And that's something that the UK really needs to explore. So there's also some business opportunities in the UAM sector, uh, right, Charlie? Uh, yes, there definitely are. And um, I, I should say that the the UAM sector, urban air mobility sector, electric vertical takeoff and landing sector, they're very much trying to position themselves as part of this sustainability solution. You know, most of those aircraft are, are proposing to use uh, either electric or hybrid electric, or in some cases, uh, hydrogen propulsion systems. So they, they feel they're going to be at the cutting edge there. Um, but what I thought was interesting this week is that there's far more evidence now that this sector that we've, you know, we've loosely banded together as urban air mobility is actually a lot more diverse than most people picture it. Most people think of it as a four-seater EVATOL, you know, flying 20 or 30 miles in, in, in a congested area like Los Angeles. Increasingly, it's going to involve fixed wing aircraft with new propulsion systems that can fly further and will actually provide new regional intercity uh, services rather than just intra-city services. Uh, so one presentation was from the German company Lilium, and they're developing an aircraft just like that. They're not looking to be a sort of city hopper air taxi service. They're going to fly uh, up to about 200 miles. And one extraordinary fact that leapt out of me from Lilium was they said that, you know, with a, with a network of aircraft, they could deliver 10,000 kilometers of new high-speed transportation next network. And they pointed out that that's more than three times the scale of France's famous TGV rail network. And they say that they can do this at a fraction of the cost of rail infrastructure being added. So in Britain, you know, there's, there's a plan to try and add a new rail network called HS2. It's going to cost hundreds of billions of, of pounds, in fact, almost a billion pounds. And and Lilium are kind of bragging that they could do that for two or 300 uh, billion pounds. Um, and that's really interesting when we talk about the sustainability debate, because until pretty recently, you know, it was sort of train is seen as a good thing, airplane, airplane is seen as a bad thing. And I think particularly, you know, these urban air mobility pioneers, they're trying to blur those lines. Yeah, and I, I just want to clarify, uh, I think Lilium, uh, two to 300 million pounds, not billion, right? You're absolutely right. I do beg your pardon. I misspoke. <laughs> no, no, I just want to make sure. <laughs> so w what was the focus of UAM uh, otherwise during the FIA Connect uh, conferences? <laughs> Well, the main focus was really trying to explain to to an audience that isn't necessarily completely tuned into this what is involved. And the big the big discussion point was it's not a question of you know uh, multi billionaire gives you a lot of money and you go develop a new airplane to go flying in. It was about how this has to involve an entire ecosystem that involves um, an air traffic management system. Um, uh, facilities on the ground uh, that, that people will board aircraft in and where aircraft will get recharged, um, how exactly these aircraft are going to operate in different areas. For example, you know, they could follow the paths of highways to avoid generating a lot of extra noise. So it was really telling the story of how it's going to take a complex ecosystem to make this viable. And the other word was to make it publicly acceptable because, you know, really people in the sector fully understand they're not just going to be able to impose this on communities. There will have to be acceptance based on proof of safety and, and proof of, of public worth, you know, that it's not just a, a, another play thing for the 1%, that it's actually going to be public service. Right. And the city officials also have to buy into this, right? Yes. And those city officials are unlikely to buy into it unless they feel they can sell it to their public. Because after all, in most countries, city, city officials are elected. So nobody wants to be the city official who tried to impose this thing on his or her city that the, that the voters aren't happy with. Right. So I probably should note that FIA cover is available on AI and online. And also we have a digital flip through book with pretty much all the stories we did this week in a more conventional format, like a print magazine. Thanks for listening to AI and Debrief. 
Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, go to www.ainonline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN.